So the lead, uh, the discussion and panel today is our very own, the Alfred Thayer Mahan Distinguished Professor of Sea Power and Grant Strategy, Professor John Maurer. Over to you, John. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this morning, we are fortunate to have such a distinguished panel of authors with us. Uh, you already know these panelists. Uh, they have written works that are part of our curriculum. So you have met them through their writings. Uh, you've read their work in the strategy courses. Uh, right next to me is Professor Paul Kennedy, who comes to us from Yale University, uh, where he serves as the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History. He's the founding director of International Security Studies at Yale, a distinguished fellow of the Brady Johnson Program in Grad Strategy. He's an award-winning author, internationally known for his writings and commentaries on global, political, economic, and strategic affairs. He's the author or editor of 19 books, uh, including The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery and The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, two of the staple texts that we use in the strategy courses. And his most recent book is Victory at Sea, Naval Power and the Transformation of the Global Order in World War II, a fantastic history of the war at sea during the Second World War. Uh, further to the right is uh, Dr. Toshi Ashihara. He comes to us from the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, where he is a senior fellow. He was educated at Georgetown's uh, School of Foreign Service and also at the School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University in Washington and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Uh, he previously served here at the Naval War College as the John A. Van Buren Chair of Asia Pacific Studies and a professor of strategy, a colleague of mine uh, here at the Naval War College. He is a, a prolific author of important studies on maritime Asia, naval warfare, naval history, and sea power. Some of his works are seizing on weakness, allied strategy for competing with China's globalizing military, Dragon Against the Sun, Chinese Views of Japanese Sea Power. He's also the author of a book that we use uh, in the course, uh, Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy. He has a book that came out recently uh, entitled Mao's Army Goes to Sea, The Island Campaigns and the Founding of China's Navy. Uh, a, a really wonderful book at the foundation of the People's Liberation Army Navy. Dr. Emily Goldman, uh, at the far end of the table, uh, comes to us from U.S. Cyber Command, where she is currently a strategist and thought leader on cyber policy. Uh, she was cyber advisor to the Director of Policy Planning at the Department of State. Uh, she also directed the U.S. Cyber Command National Security Agency Combined Action Group, leading the team that wrote the 2018 U.S. Cyber Command vision, Achieve and Maintain Cyberspace Superiority. She was educated at the University of Pennsylvania and Stanford University. She served as professor of political science at the University of California, Davis, for two decades before entering into government service. She's the author of several important books on strategy, uh, including Sunken Treaties, Naval Arms Control Between the Wars, The Information Revolution and Military Affairs in Asia, the Diffusion of Military Technology and Ideas, Cyber Analogies, and her book, Cyber Persistence, Redefining National Security in Cyberspace, was published uh, 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 a year ago by the Oxford University Press. She also served here at the Naval War College on the faculty as a Secretary of the Navy Fellow. Again, we have a distinguished panel here today for you to enjoy. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Mara. Thank you, John, very much indeed for your collective introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so thrilled to be, to be back here. It's, um, it's something that I enjoy doing. I had an eerie feeling this morning, though, that uh, I, I felt I'd, I'd sensed um, 
ghosts from the past. And I just realized that the first ever time in which I was invited to come and talk to the Naval War College was back in the, in the 1980s because of a fascination by some of the staff here at a book of mine called The Rise of the Anglo-German Antagonism. Mm -hmm. And so what I was to do was to be the history expert on how the Anglo-German rivalry before the First World War would give us lessons, lessons of history, ladies and gentlemen, for the, the strife against, the, the contestation against uh, Soviet naval power in the, in the 1980s. And I, I was trying to deny the fact that the historian had that much to teach, but over time I think I realized we, we probably do if we can do it in a modest way and a suggestive way. So I'm really glad to be invited back to this annual forum. I uh, appreciate that. Um, it occurred to me, John, that in, since I was I'm the first to go of our panel, that I might, for my own clarity of mind, and maybe as a, a help to segue into what is following, to offer you the idea that uh, looking at maritime strategy, past, present, and, and future, it might, might be useful to do what I did the other day to myself, which was to um, identify uh, four particular periods in the, over the past century in the evolution of US maritime statecraft. So I didn't go all the way back into the 19th century, but I thought, you know, it, if, if I started 100 years ago in the year 1924, 25, or the early 20s, what could I say about um, the way it changes over time quite significantly? Because our world also could change significantly, and who knows, in the next 10 years or so, and we should not be taken by surprise if we're in a new period of needing to think ourselves about maritime statecraft. So I, I would identify the first of the periods, um, maritime statecraft during the isolationist period from 1920s to 1939. And then the second one, and this is very predictable to you, of a US maritime statecraft and strategy in the age of, of increasing jointness with the Royal Navy with, as part of a great allied coalition from 1940, 41 until 45. And then a different phase entirely, the third phase, which would be US maritime statecraft in the Cold War period, like from 1945 to 1989. And then the fourth period would be US maritime statecraft in this post-Cold War uh, era of ours, including the era which we're now in, which is the era of thinking such a lot about the China challenge, as opposed to a Russian or Soviet challenge. Now, in that very first period, the 1920s to 39, it seems to me that the following features stand out. We had a deep concern for the Pacific and the Far East theaters, much less so than in the Atlantic. Uh, the US was keeping all through that period of the 20s and 30s quite a significant distance from Great Britain. But it still kind of expected the British to check any German or, Lord help us, Italian expansion or inroads. So ironically, we had in the interwar period a foreign navy the Royal Navy, ensuring that the Monroe Doctrine was preserved. There was no way in which German or Italian intrusions could occur in the Western Hemisphere over the shape of the Royal Navy. We tended then in that period to have a, a battleship-heavy navy. Uh, it's true that this is a period of uh, rising plans and hopes and leaderships of the, of the new group of US aircraft carrier uh, leaders, but still uh, they feel all the time that they're in a secondary role to 
of the battleship. The battleship admirals felt that carriers were the lesser weapon. It was thought, they were separated so significantly. If you look at where are the, the US carriers in the year on year in the late 30s, uh, quite a lot of them on their own doing some Atlantic patrol. They're not, as we think of them, concentrated together out of Pearl Harbor. That's going to be something which happens after 1942. Uh, they're not in the Far East. This Navy of the interwar years seems, at least by comparison with the Royal Navy, to have no interest whatsoever in anti-submarine warfare. Uh, that was a that was a unglamorous form of warfare, and you didn't need to think about it. And little of that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, little of that changed in the 1939 to 1940-41 period, even with the coming of war in Europe. So there are curious aspects to the maritime statecraft and strategy of our Navy in the 1920s and 30s. In the second stage, US maritime strategy in the war of 1941 to 45, again, I think one sees how little the US Navy features or thinks of featuring in the Atlantic theater. Its battleships, many of them are damaged and sunk at Pearl Harbor. The carriers are almost all in the Pacific somewhere, on, or on the West Coast. And they concentrate and find that they have a new, exciting role for themselves because there isn't a battleship leaded, uh, leading role for the US Navy in the Pacific. And the carriers can step in and contest uh, for control of the Central Pacific against Japanese carriers. This is a period where we get the rise of the famous carrier admirals of Halsey, Fletcher, and the other ones. They become the heroes of the US Navy. Uh, and very few people nowadays, even including naval historians like myself, can remember much about the, the battleship admirals or the great battleship captains of the US Navy in the Second World War. We, we, uh, the names that come to us are those of the, of the carrier leaders. It leads to the development of this fantastic long-range carrier warfare. Fleet supply on the one hand, amphibious landings on the other hand, and carrier aircraft protection are all through. So even, I would say, even at uh, the event of D-Day in June 1944, US naval presence in the Atlantic is slim. We send a few older, restored uh, Pearl Harbor battleships to join in the bombardment of the shores of Normandy. Uh, but all of our interest is, is over there in the exciting large-scale uh, struggle for the Central and the Western Pacific. Um, the Battle of the Atlantic is still not joined very much by the US Navy, except for protection of the routes to, of supply routes to the US forces which are in North Africa. But the Battle of the North Atlantic is, is not ours. So compared to the huge effort and success in the Pacific Ocean, there wasn't much space for maritime statecraft. In a funny way, there wasn't much space for maritime statecraft in the successful large Pacific realm either, because all that was wanted was more and more carriers to have this incredible punch by the time you get to mid or late 1943, the idea that you have a Navy which has got up to 10 fleet and light fleet carriers, which can push your way right away across the Pacific, what need is there in that, in that dimension of maritime statecraft? Uh, it's a winning of battles and the seizure of territories which characterize the place. 
we have much more sense of the US Navy interested in maritime strategy and maritime statecraft when you move on out of the Second World War into the Cold War itself. The Cold War itself is essentially uh, being contested at the non-military level, which is why statecraft and the role of the Navy in a very different way become so significant. The US Navy is now attached to NATO. It has, at least in some ways in the planning stages, uh, think, it, it is doing thinking about how to protect the sea lanes across the Atlantic in the event of, say, Soviet submarines inter interrupting it. it. It puts its own big fleet into the Mediterranean. That is such a dramatic change in the whole long sweep of US naval policy beforehand. And I, I still don't know the early documentation about that. Maybe Professor Mapra does, but so just who made the decision that we were going to step in and put a big U.S. almost permanent presence, right, really, out of Naples uh, in the Med? What a what a message to the Europeans, but also what a message to the Soviets as well. We give naval support in the Pacific for Japan and uh, treaty assurances to Australia and New Zealand. This is maritime statecraft to a very, very large degree. And we are the inheritors of much of that statecraft of the period 45 to 91. We're still the inheritors of that. So with the end of the Cold War after 1990, uh, we've had a, in one way we've had a problem. I can still remember Gorbachev uh, making a visit to the US and making a visit, I think, to Yale and saying, we are going to give you Americans a headache. We are going to give you a problem because we're going to take away from you your enemy. And I think he, that man was really serious about that. He had, did he not know that waiting in the wings was somebody else named Putin who didn't have, didn't share Gorbachev's view of getting rid of a Cold War. Um, but for a while, the US Navy floundered in the 1990s, trying to redefine itself. I think if one looks at the, uh, the records of the various speakers who came into this hall, the people who talked about what is the purpose of the Navy now, if any of, uh, any of you are inclined to do research would just go and look at what was said in, to, to the officers of the early 1990s about what is our armed service for. We, we were scratching our heads a lot. We were trying to think of already uh, more of an Asian role, already more of a Pacific role. Uh, what do we do when uh, we don't need that big American fleet in the Mediterranean so much? And therefore, with some relief, I'm not being cynical here. I think I detected it among listening to senior officers, some relief at the rise of a China threat. It helps you in your budgetary arguments. It helps you in your training. It helps you in your thinking about how to keep a navy together. It helps you in the, in, the, in the sense that we should try to use as many allies, naval allies, maritime allies as possible. And so uh, blissfully, I will end on this note, and I, again, I assure you I'm not being cynical or laughing in my cheek. Bl blissfully, it seems to me, the China threat has allowed the revival of American maritime uh, statecraft. We need it desperately now because we are in a contestation. We don't want to go to a, a, any form of physical warfare, but we do want to maintain our maritime links and our maritime alliances. And um, that's where we are. 
I think the story has been a really interesting one, John, of the ups and downs of this over the past hundred years, but there are parts of those past hundred years where we can take examples which could uh, instruct us and help us in the he head-scratching uh, sort of scenario we have today. Thanks for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Th thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Toshi, you're up next. Thank you, John. <clears throat> it's uh, always a pleasure to be back uh, at the Naval War College. Uh, my talk this morning will dovetail very well with um, Dr. Krepinevich's concept of uh, archipelagic defense. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be offering essentially a red team perspective. I promise I didn't coordinate this uh, with Dr. Krepinevich in advance, uh, purely coincidental. Uh, what I'd like to do is to carry forward some of uh, my ideas and writings that actually started here at the Naval War College. Uh, the concept that I'd like to assess is the role of land-based maritime strike systems designed to shore up U.S. and allied deterrence in the Western Pacific. Um, a group of like-minded folks uh, like um, Professor Jim Holmes, who you saw, and Dr. Krepinevich, uh, wrote in different places about this idea around the same time, uh, about the need to deploy uh, shore-based missile batteries along uh, the so-called First Island chain to hold uh, Chinese naval assets at risk. Um, I focused in particular on how Japan could turn the tables on China by deploying its own uh, truck-mounted ship-killing missiles on key terrain to make uh, um, large parts of the East China Sea um, inhospitable to the Chinese uh, Navy. Now, uh, there should be a map that should be coming up fairly shortly on the first island chain. There you go. Um, so. Um, to give you a geospatial sense of what this all looks like, um, archipelagic defense, uh, take a look at the map behind me. Um, we typically have a west to east view of the world uh, if we go from the left-hand side of the map to the right-hand side of the map. In this case, uh, going from left to right, we have a north uh, to, to south view. So this map essentially rotates our perspective so that mainland China, in this case, is sort of sitting on its side, if you will. Uh, this map, I think, helps us view the Western Pacific through Beijing's eyes. So if you're sitting in Beijing, looking out into the Western Pacific, uh, this might be what it might look like to Chinese decision makers. And the islands just offshore, uh, as you'll see, uh, the first island chain uh, stretches from Japan through Taiwan uh, down to the Philippines. And they form a series of choke points and near seas through which Chinese mariners, whether they're commercial or military in nature, uh, must pass through to reach the open waters of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Chinese strategists describe the first island chain as, not surprisingly, a maritime straitjacket. This map also shows the notional ranges uh, of the various land-based anti-ship missiles that could be deployed or that has been deployed on Japan, Taiwan, and the Philippines. And you'll notice how those ranges uh, cover large parts of the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea, South China Sea, and the seas to the east of the first island chain. So my purpose here today is to talk about Chinese reactions to this missile initiative, which has gained momentum in recent years as the United States and its allies have either deployed operational units or experimented with this concept. So, so why should we look at what the Chinese are saying? Well, as students of the strategy and policy department um, course, uh, you all know that competition and strategy are inherently interactive. Uh, you've heard the mantra that the enemy gets a vote or that the adversary is not a potted plant. And so discerning the Chinese discourse will tell us much about how Beijing perceives US and allied shore-based maritime strike whether the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, uh, will be responsive to our initiatives, uh, and how China might respond to the perceived threat. In other words, what the Chinese are saying might tell us whether our efforts are producing the intended effects. So it's a red team perspective to discern our maritime uh, posture, strategy, and so forth. So what I'm gonna first of all talk about um, is what the Chinese writings are saying about US allied coastal defense missile systems. 
Then I'll speculate uh, about the deeper sources of Chinese reactions to allied capabilities. And finally, I'll discuss what China might do about this missile challenge. Now, to be clear, uh, my talk is based on uh, Chinese open sources, many of them from authoritative technical journals. Uh, I've been tracking this discourse for well over a decade, and what I want to do here is to simply let the Chinese speak for themselves. And so I will be quoting Chinese analysts uh, at, at length, because there's a lot of really good stuff in there in terms of getting the, the, the uh, Chinese viewpoint. Uh, first. Uh, the Chinese have commented extensively on Japanese, Taiwanese, and American missile systems. So let's start with Japan. According to one Chinese analyst who really captures uh, their perceived problem set uh, for China, uh, this is uh, what, what, what he says, quote, Japan has historically highly valued the development of vehicle-mounted short-of-ship missiles, making them a top priority for coastal defense. Coastal anti-ship missiles possess characteristics of long range, high accuracy, and great destructiveness. They can effectively stop enemy vessels from nearing the coastline and under appropriate circumstances can control or blockade important maritime junctions such as straits, sea lanes, estuaries, and so forth. As an island nation with long coastlines, Japan has passionately devoted its energies to the development of coastal anti-ship missiles." End quote. So you get a sense for how the Chinese perceives Japanese incentives for, for uh, having these systems. Chinese commentators have also paid close attention to the deployment of such coastal defense systems over the past decade. When Japan deployed truck-mounted anti-ship missile batteries to the Southwest Islands in 2013 and 2014, these movements triggered a firestorm of commentary among Chinese observers, including warnings that Japan was playing with fire. Uh, notably, in June 2014, the foreign ministry uh, spokeswoman publicly expressed Beijing's concerns, which was my first tell that this capability had caught the attention of Chinese officialdom. Besides deployment, Chinese analysts have directed their attention to a new generation of Japan's missiles, the Type 12. They've examined the missile's greater range, improved accuracy, improved sensors, improved launchers, and its expected versatility as a weapon that could be launched from surface ships, submarines, aircraft, and trucks. In other words, they're really looking down into the tactical details of these capabilities. Uh, the Chinese have also watched with concern Japan's demonstration of its ship-killing capabilities during Allied exercises. The commentary uh, about the Rim of the Pacific exercise in 2018 was particularly eye-opening. Uh, that year, the United States, Australia, and Japan uh, conducted a sink at sea live fire training exercises during which a Japanese unit uh, fired its Type 12 anti-ship cruise missiles uh, at a decommissioned vessel. In response, two Chinese analysts, a few months after the exercise, wrote, quote, the United States and its allies highly value the development of anti-ship capabilities. They intend to use multiple short, medium, long-range fires to cover the first island chain. Different countries will coordinate multiple platforms and multiple munitions to construct a land, sea, air, cross-domain, new type anti-surface warfare system. Quite a mouthful. Uh, they intend to strengthen, this is the key passage, they intend to strengthen their ocean control over the Western Pacific region, end quote. To the Chinese, Japan represents a triple threat. It possesses prime real estate on which ground-based anti-ship missiles would be based. It boasts a diversifying anti-ship missile force that can threaten the Chinese fleet from land, air, and sea and it is a key member of a maritime coalition that could severely complicate China's access to the seas. Let me now turn to Chinese views of Taiwan. Now, Taiwan has its own uh, system, the Shengfeng-3. What I'd like to focus on is actually Chinese reaction to the news in 2020 that the U.S. had approved sales of a harpoon coastal defense system to Taiwan. Uh, the deal includes uh, launchers, missiles, and other supporting equipment. So to, to three analysts from the Chinese Naval Command College, they believe that the harpoons could threaten China's surface action groups and carrier strike groups, including large and medium combatants within those formations. The missiles, according to them, could be used to launch, quote, multi-point salvos, multi-directional raids to saturate our air defense systems and attrit our air defense resources, and in combination with other main forces, conduct large-scale firepower strikes against our naval fleets. Such attacks would pose, quote, a comparatively big threat 
uh, to our warships and seriously circumscribe our freedom of maneuver, thereby influence our operational effectiveness and delay our campaign progress, end quote. I mean, that's a pretty frank assessment of the dangers that the Chinese fleet might face. Let me now turn to the United States. Chinese commentators have also closely studied missiles that are expected to be fielded by the U.S. military. PLA uh, journals, for example, have published um, features on the Naval st uh, Strike Missile as an element of the U.S. Marine Corps' ground-based ship killer. Chinese observers appear quite impressed with the missile's stealthy exterior, autonomous operations, sea-skimming flight profile, the ability to operate with other platforms across a wide expanse, high subsonic speed, great maneuverability, pinpoint accuracy, and sophisticated sensors. So again, they have closely studied all the platforms and weapon systems that have been deployed or planned to be uh, deployed by the United States. According to one Chinese analyst, quote, we must pay close attention to this threat. In a naval combat area filled with numerous islands like the first island chain, the tactical deployment of such autonomous weapons that uses the land to control the sea can form a real chain. If we cannot break these shackles, I love that word, shackles, we will be blockaded in the near seas and will be unable to enter, enter and undertake mobile operations across the wide oceans, end quote. When the U.S. Army deployed the mid-range capability, a land-based maritime strike system that can launch different missile types to northern Luzon and the Philippines this April, it occasioned another round of excited commentary in China. Let me just give you one example. Uh, quote, and th this is a somewhat long one because, again, it has a lot of good stuff in it. Quote, the most noteworthy thing about the deployment to Luzon Island in the Philippines is the deployment location. To the north of Luzon Island is the Bashi Strait. You should, you know, um, just to look at the map. And this strait is where the U.S. aircraft carrier formation enters the South China Sea, and China's naval and air forces leave the island chain and enter the Pacific. It is obvious that the deployment is for the purpose of practicing possible future intervention in the Taiwan Strait. The threat to bases in coastal provinces is self-evident, meaning China's coastal provinces. And multi-purpose missiles will also be used to block important waterways, sea and airspace, affecting our operations and the safety of our amphibious forces. In the future, this force may also appear in Japan and South Korea, becoming the vanguard of the U.S. Army's intervention in the Western Pacific, and it is worthy of high vigilance, end quote. Let me now offer some thoughts about why the Chinese appear to take this threat so seriously. As the writing shows, there are good, there are good technical and tactical reasons to be concerned. And the Chinese, of course, have a much bigger fleet that they need to worry about than in the past. But I think there are actually other deeper reasons that we should try to better understand. The first is a sort of projection. The Chinese have long believed that their own land-based systems are highly efficacious. My earlier Chinese quote identifies an important concept in Chinese military thought, and that concept is using the land to control the seas. This idea goes all the way back to the founding of the People's Republic and the Chinese Navy when Beijing had to deal with maritime threats. China then doubled down on coastal artillery and shore-based aircraft to, to defend in the, sea, in the seaward direction, just as the PLA today has a massive land-based air and missile force for maritime strike. Since they believe in the efficacy of these systems, they likely believe that it would serve the United States and its allies as well. The second, I believe, is historical trauma. The Chinese have endlessly relitigated the first Sino-Japanese War of 1894 and 95 when the Beiyang fleet was lost to the Imperial Japanese Navy. They understand that they could suffer a similar defeat today and in the future and potentially lose a fleet in a single afternoon. They also appreciate that it takes decades to recover from such a loss given the capital intensive character of naval power. And so this historical understanding may also go far to explain China's risk calculus. The third is politics. Xi Jinping and his predecessors uh, invested a lot of political capital to make the case for building these uh, capital-intensive ships. So even authoritarians, of course, have to make the case for building a navy. And of course, uh, if you spend all that political capital and then you lose it in a single afternoon, there are likely going to be major political repercussions and therefore would have a huge influence on the leadership's political calculus. That's another potential source of Chinese 
uh, threat perceptions. And the fourth is, as I've mentioned throughout my presentation, is that China sees an emerging regional coalition uh, centered on this missile-centric approach. And of course, one of the things that China has feared for a long time is diplomatic isolation. If you look back to the PLA's literature on the first Gulf War, one of the things that they were very impressed about from the U.S. perspective was that, was that the United States was able to very quickly form a multinational coalition to isolate Iraq. It's one of the things that China wants to avoid. And this is what they're seeing along the maritime periphery uh, in this context. So the interaction between China and its opponents in this region um, has as much to do with psychology as it has to do with material capabilities. Finally, in conclusion, uh, what might the PLA do to deal with this missile threat? Well, the three analysts from the Chinese Naval Command College that I cited previously recommend four broad countermeasures. First, they believe the PLA should prepare to conduct preemptive strikes against the missile bases, launch sites, storage facilities, and the missile batteries uh, before those missiles are launched. Uh, they believe in uh, the, the use of intensive assaults uh, that would be followed up by continuous suppression and firepower strikes involving anti-radiation munitions. The second, they believe that China should, con should construct a comprehensive early warning surveillance reconnaissance system involving assets in space, in the air, at sea, and on land to detect and respond to the missile threat. Third, Chinese forces should put up multi-layered active defenses to intercept incoming missiles at every stage of their fi flight paths that would involve aircraft, long-range shipborne air defense missiles, short-range point defense systems that could, that could provide outer, middle, and inner defensive layers, respectively. Finally, they believe the PLA should, em should employ manned and unmanned electronic warfare aircraft to jam and to deceive the missiles and to use large amounts of decoys and chaff to flood the battle space with false targets. At a minimum, if this is indeed where the PLA is going or thinking about, this suggests some pretty costly moves and potential opportunity costs for the PLA going forward. In any event, uh, the literature reveals that the PLA is in fact quite sensitive to missile proliferation. Chinese observers take seriously uh, the new generation of anti-ship missiles that would make Chinese fleet defenses far more challenging in the coming years and could also gravely limit the Chinese Navy's freedom to operate within the first island chain as well as its ability to access the wider Pacific Ocean and beyond. And so in my view, I think we do need to keep track of this literature to assess this interaction and to discern what this all means in terms of U.S. maritime strategy. And with that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Toshi. <laughs> Emily, over to you. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be back at the Naval War College and um, I really enjoy visiting and, and speaking to um, the students and the faculty. Um, Dr. Maurer requested that I talk a little bit more generally about the broader strategic environment and some of the key elements that I see. He reassured me that between Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Yoshihara, you would get plenty of salt. So I'm going to give you some pepper, maybe we shouldn't think about it that way. Okay, at any rate, um, I wanna focus on three strategic challenges in the global environment that I think have really important ramifications for our national security, and a lot of these themes have, have um, come up today in, in some of the prior discussions. Um, the first one is that we're facing an unprecedented competitive challenge and threat. The second is that accelerating technological change is producing a very rapidly expanding art of the possible that we have to think about mastering. And the third element, which has been um, discussed sort of tangentially, is the growing number of non-state entities that are empowered through technological innovation and are capable of having consequential impact, not only in competition, but actually in war as well. And I think this is something new. So let me walk through these and then I'll talk about some broader strategic implications um, going forward. Um, first, China. I mean, I know all of you have spent probably the year studying this. This is the, you know, as, as my boss says, 
You know, it's, it's all about the PRC, right? Um, it has demonstrated the intent um, and the rapidly growing capability to threaten the United States leadership and, as David Sanger talked, also reshape the international system. So it's both an urgent military threat in the Indo-Pacific and really an enduring generational um, challenge across all elements of national power. I think another point that um, we really haven't had a geostrategic economic competitor um, probably since Great Britain, and it really wasn't a competitor in the same sense. Um, and the Secretary of the Navy has emphasized in his speech at Harvard um, the naval buildup, but I would argue that it's even as evident or more evident in the areas of intelligence and cyber, where the PRC is engaged in a deliberate campaign to displace U.S. technological superiority. Um, they're placing our critical national infrastructure at r risk, and this we know, and this has been discussed um, publicly by the directors of CISA, the FBI, the National Security Agency. They're operating today. They're actively positioning for strategic decision in the, in the near future. Um, and as David Sanger referenced, um, for example, the Chinese malicious state-sponsored um, actor Volt Typhoon is targeting critical infrastructure in Guam and in other areas in the United States. So there's a whole series of implications of this for the security of the defense industrial base, the security of our supply chains, and even beginning to think about what this means for, um, for the security of, our, um, of, the, of the codes and keys that are protecting our weapon systems and how we need to think about you know, a future of post-quantum encryption. So there's a whole range of you know, um, sort of underlying factors that are affecting how we think about the PRC threat. Um, I think the challenge is continuing to grow in scope and scale and sophistication. Um, they're highly capable of, of rapidly exploiting opportunities because they're unconstrained by law and policy in the same way the United States is. Okay, so we spend an awful lot of time um, in the policy and legal deliberation process, which is appropriate because that is the nature of our Constitution and our government. But we have to understand that that creates um, challenges for us, and we have to have processes that really allow us to operate with greater speed and agility. Um, they also demonstrate a risk tolerance that allows them to operate much more effectively within our open society. Um, and this goes not just for China, but Russia, um, Iran in terms of leveraging the openness of our information space to shape behavior and also to foment discord among us. Um, and at the same time, we face um, significant challenges operating in their closed, centrally controlled environment. Once again, another asymmetry. I think it's also important to recognize that in a generation Cyberspace um, has enabled the PRC's rise as an economic, a military, and an, and an informational power at the fraction of the cost of research and development without having to go to war, and in a manner that has closed the military offset between the United States and the PRC. Historically, if you wanted to plunder another country, you actually had to invade it. Now, our our adversaries can st step back and remotely plunder the intellectual property and the wealth um, and the information without ever breaching our territorial borders. This is something that we have not figured out how to understand how to, how to deal with this because our policies and our laws and international law were really designed um, for a world of territoriality and sovereignty, and cyberspace challenges that. Um, I'd also argue that there was a time when national security was largely a function of military strength and kinetic conflict was the ultimate locus of strategic decision. But I would argue that today's strategic decision can be achieved without war. Okay, strategic advantage in terms of China's um, increase in its GDP from, um, from $120 billion in today's dollars in 1973 to trillions of dollars today. 
okay, rivaling the United States. This was achieved without kinetic conflict. Okay, this was achieved without the use or the threat of force. Um, so that represents, you know, what we political scientists would talk about is a dramatic shift in the balance of power. Um, and I'm going to return to that because I think that is something that we all need to be cognizant of. Cognizant, cognizant of. And I think. Um, also recognize that we need to be able to contest China below the level of armed conflict. It's not just about fighting and winning a kinetic war, okay? Because um, you all know the, the Sun Tzu statement, the acme of skill is to win without fighting. And they have a doctrine that says they want to win without fighting. So it's incumbent upon us to be able to address that as well. And the, the Department of Defense has an important role to play in that. I think that that's in a way what the Secretary, that in my view, that is what he means by intense strategic competition. Okay, the second major um, uh, change in the global environment, accelerating technological change and global interconnectedness, which are producing a rapidly expanding art of the possible. What's important to recognize here is that technological advances and innovation, which we've all talked about and which Dr. Krapnevich has written about extensively, today they are arising from diverse entities worldwide. There is no longer a single global technology leader. Um, nation state research and development is not the principal driver of technology change. It's coming out of academia, it's coming out of corporations, it's coming out of individuals working together and collaborating. And this is becoming increasingly consequential. So it used to be, one can think of national security, um, that we generated the waves to ride. Now I think it's more that we need to recognize and ride the waves that we don't generate and we cannot necessarily control, okay? The secretary talks about maritime diplomacy as a whole of government effort. That is true, but it is much broader than that. It's a whole of nation plus effort, okay? It, it involves not just all of government, but society, industry, and our partners abroad. Um, because of the accelerating cha change and pace of technology, advantage will go to those who are able to see first, recognize first, adapt and apply first. So what we you know what we say in the command, at least in Cyber Command, it's no longer the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. All right. Um, and people talk about the world is going to fundamentally change. I would argue it already has. We have to recognize, we have to adapt. Speed and agility are key, key and not only in operations, but in capability development and in acquisition. That requires us to challenge established um, approaches and move more toward rapid innovation. Um, so, I mean, in particular, what we're seeing in, in the cyber domain, and I think it applies in other domains as well, is that the existing programmatic and, and acquisition processes are moving much more slowly than the rate of change, and we cannot sustain that. Um, a third um, a strategic challenge is what I mentioned as the dramatically expanding set of global actors and non-state entities that are empowered by technology and they are creating and exercising consequential impact in competition and in conflict. Okay. This is something that we understand intuitively in the cyberspace domain, okay? And we see it every day um, because we're operating continuously every day, touching a whole range of actors, state, non-state, public, private, um, adversaries, friends. Um, but I'm not, I, I think we need to um, increase that appreciation across the rest of the joint force. Um, we are no longer in this duality of peace war because we are engaging our adversaries across the spectrum of competition, crisis, and conflict every day. And David Sanger talked a little bit about this when he brought up um, the OPM hack, right? And we talk about ransomware attacks, the, the, the theft of intellectual property. All of that is having a consequential impact on U.S. power, military economic power, as well as alliance solidarity and social cohesion. All of that is happening, and that's happening in competition, and many of the actors who are creating that are not state actors. Um, then let's look at like the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And what we see there, um, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of this was Elon Musk's uh, unilateral decision 
to deploy and operationalize Starlink. This was an individual who made a decision that had an impact of the course of war on the battlefield, all right? Um, I don't think this is something that, um, that we've really wrestled with, that state militaries are no longer alone, um, that in particular among non-state actors, we have independent corporate powers, particularly corporate cyber powers, that can have direct operational impact on who wins or who loses, okay? So prior to the invasion of Ukraine, Microsoft, um, enabled the protection of the Ukrainian government data by moving it wholesale to the cloud, all right? Um, and that helped protect and secure their ability, their command and control. Post-invasion, once again, Starlink provided thousands of terminals, increased the bandwidth, um, and enabled Ukraine to continue to function. So what's really interesting, I think, now is that we talk a lot about and we debate U.S. military support um, in the war in Ukraine. Um, it's a very prominent discussion. Um, but there's little discussion about what would be the consequential impact if corporate support waned, okay? We haven't thought about that yet, but I think that's something that, that we need to take into consideration. Um, so what are some of the ramifications of these changes in the global environment? The first one is that although I believe we are effective today, we will not remain so without deliberate change. Our adversaries are adapting and changing, and they always have historically. Um, we cannot assume continued technological dominance, and so we're going to have to behave differently and take that on directly. And that goes across military, intelligence, um, the entire uh, defense enterprise. Secondly, the drivers of change are going to emerge rapidly and unpredictably, okay? And what that means is that we have to um, operate with speed and agility um, in order to achieve unity of effort, all right? Um, we have to recognize the constraints of our organizations, relax those constraints. Um, we have to also recognize that we live in a world where no single entity has all the talent all the intellectual capital, all the data, all the compute capabilities, and all the authorities to meet the challenges and the ability to exploit fleeting opportunity, okay? So, you know, we talk very much, um, the DOD talks very much about fighting as part of an alliance, right? Um, and I think that's critical, and it's not just alliance, it's when, within part, with partners more broadly. Interestingly, our adversaries recognize that, and so you see them making tremendous efforts to, to peel those allies away, right, as, as sort of a, a, an element of um, our center of gravity. The third implication is that um, agile collaboration among a shifting set of stakeholders um, across boundaries, public, private, domestic, foreign, is a necessity um, uh, for success. Um, and um, I just want to return once again to the critical role of the private sector and say that the United States should not be leaving the future um, of that relationship up to circumstance or to chance. Okay, because Russia-Ukraine was a really unique situation. Russia made it very, very easy because corporate powers, private sector had very little economic investment. Uh, Russia's behavior was so morally um, repugnant that it made it really easy for these companies to be on the side of Ukraine, all right? I don't think a savvier adversary or one where our private sector has a much greater economic state, stake is going to make it that easy. So we better be thinking about right now, okay? We often talk about treaties with other countries. What does that look like with, I mean, we can't wait till a crisis to then engage these companies. Um, so I think that's another implication. And what I want to con conclude on now is to sort of bring that conversation about the challenges and, and opportunities as well back to the warfighter. Um, and back to strategic thinkers, which the secretary mentioned and which I believe um, Dr. Kravinevich put the quote up about the importance of warfighters being strategic thinkers. And I'd like to just leave you with the thought that, um, that we 
operate, the United States operates within three distinct strategic environments, okay? And I'm gonna use that term, um, and I discuss this in, in our book, very specifically, okay? A strategic environment is a set of conditions that are created by a condition of technology that independently can shift the balance of power, okay? And there are three strategic environments. Two of them we are very familiar with, we spent centuries in some cases, decades studying them. One of them is new. Um, the nuclear environment is one we've spent decades, um, almost coming up on a century, um, examining. Um, and it is one that, that we understand that in that environment, if we want to be secure, right, the only way to do that is to preserve, uh, to prevent our adversary from going to war. Okay, you can't fight and you can't win. So security depends on, the, is not in your hands, it's in the hands of your adversary, and therefore we spend a tremendous amount of resources and capability to try to create a credible deterrent to convince our adversaries that it, it is not worth going to war. Okay, we, we understand that. Security is about the absence of war. We've talked a lot today about the conventional strategic environment, which is a changing and evolving one over the centuries, and it really is about mastering and understanding the offense and defense technology and designing um, a strategy to win in episodic engagements, right? And so um, this is critically important as well. Um, I would argue that of course, I'm at Cyber Command, that cyberspace is foundational to that, and I think that David Sanger brought that up, saying that we're learning how to integrate cyberspace into the conventional fight. I mean, essentially, you don't have mission assurance without it, right? And so it is fundamentally important that, you know, that our systems are secure, our command and control is secure, our networks, our encryption is secure. Um, and so it is foundational to the joint force being able to operate with speed and agility. And then I just wanna leave you with the final strategic environment, which is this place called cyberspace, right? Which is, I would argue, if, I, if I've made my case, our adversaries have been able to operate in and through cyberspace below armed conflict and to challenge our political, economic, military power, okay? And they've done it successfully. Um, they've done it for decades. They figured it out a lot earlier than we did and we are playing catch up. And so what cyberspace represents, it's not about you know, the absence of war or winning a war, it's about an alternative to war. Okay? It's about achieving the benefits that you might get from war, but doing it cumulatively below the threshold of armed conflict, right? And so if I return back to the, the quote of the Secretary of the Navy that, um, that says that he, you know, he demands strategic thinkers, that admirals and generals be strategic thinkers and strive first to deter, um, and then when called upon, prevail in conflict, I would argue that national security is, is I'm gonna be provocative, is not about winning wars, but it's about winning great power strategic competition. And war is one way to do that, okay? But so we can't focus only on deterring and preparing for and pre prevailing in armed conflict, but we must also prevail in strategic competition um, below that threshold, taking into account the challenges, threats, and opportunities that I described. So I hope that you'll take that away with you, and I will conclude there. Thank you, Emily. Uh, join with me in thanking the panel. <laughs>